Um, great. So, so thank you all for, for joining. It gives me, uh, it sounds cliche, it does give me great pleasure to introduce the person I've known the longest in my life, which is my father, <laughs> Francisco Marmolejo as well, um, who, who's going to be talking to us about bridging research and practice in the post-pandemic world, and particularly with a focus on higher education institutions. And, um, and I've, I've been joking with him this entire week about where to start with his long and uh, long career in higher education. Um, but, uh, but he's uh, really, I mean, he's, he's been entrenched in the world of higher education administration and internationalization in higher education um, for at, at the very least as long as I've been alive. So he used to be uh, vice rector of the University of the Americas um, where he helped the university with its accreditation process in the early 90s. But then uh, when he moved to the university, first he was a, a fellow um, of um, a higher education fellow at UMass and afterwards moved to the University of Arizona where he founded the Consortium for no North American Higher Education Collaboration, which is really where he, he really the platform that boomed to connect universities both in terms of um, research and administration throughout the Americas uh, during the time of NAFTA. After the fact, um, Francisco Sr. has uh, then moved to broader contexts beyond the Latin American context where he began uh, going on OECD missions to different countries to analyze the higher education status of, of, of countries among all continents. Um, Egypt, Chile, Kazakhstan, and, and after the fact, he moved to the World Bank, where he was the global lead of higher education practice, and eventually the, um, the lead education consultant for the Global Bank for South Asia and based in India. Um, and as of last year, he's moved to the Qatar Foundation, where he is a, um, a lead education advisor for the foundation. So with uh, these 30 plus years of experience of higher education, um, it, it makes uh, me really excited to hear um, what we can hope to see um, and what insights you, you have for this uh, strange time that we find ourselves in and what comes next, I guess. And, and I'm glad to see how this ties in to, to everything we do at MD Pareshi. Thank you for making the, the time. Thank you very much, Francisco. It, uh, you know, it's, uh, thanks for the very kind introduction. As you can see, it was uh, uh, prepared by my son. So what, what I can expect that... You know, he really said nice things about me. I really appreciate. It. I'm very proud, of course, of uh, of him, and also of uh, the work that all of you are doing uh, in in connecting more effectively research to the needs of society. And uh, so, and of course, it is quite challenging to to chat with you because I know that all of you are uh, sort of a, a very well prepared uh, researchers working in different domains in different countries, in different regions of the world. And uh, so I hope my, my humble perspectives may be uh, useful, at least for you to get a little bit confused about the significant challenges that we have in the world today and as they affect uh, higher education. Um, so all of you have been going through the experience of higher education. Some of you probably have suffered the experience of higher education. I hope most of you have enjoyed uh, the experience of higher education and also Many of you um, uh, are or will continue working in higher education probably for the rest of your life. And all of you are, of course, aware of the fact that higher education is the most significant enabler, the most significant uh, a promoter of intergenerational mobility. It is at the same time uh, the best investment that countries can make in the long term. Uh, but at the same time, higher education is experiencing significant challenges today. And many of those challenges uh, have been exacerbated because the pandemic crisis, but many of them were beyond that. So in my presentation today, I will try to connect a little bit about the past, but also about the future in terms of uh, what is going on in higher education and how higher education and research has been affected by the current pandemic. So I don't know if Francisco, it is possible to you authorize me or uh, give me permi permission to uh, share a presentation. I need okay. somebody. To give me that, uh, We're all set. I think Anna enabled it. Uh, not yet. Let me see. Wait, I'll do it right no. now. It give has been disabled. I'll make you. I should ask that. I should ask for that in advance. I apologize. Oh, no, sorry. That was me. Does it work now? Nope. Um, 
Can you can you try it now? Um, I... How about now? Uh, yeah, now it is allowing. Okay. okay, let me see. Can you see the main screen or the presenter screen? We see the full presentation. Uh, okay, in, very good. The right way. Excellent. So, um, uh, and of course, if you are interested in having a copy of the presentation, just send me an email. The, uh, once in a while, I post my email in the, as part of the presentation, and I will be delighted to, to send it to you in case that you may want to keep some of the slides. So let me just uh, a little bit, uh, talk a little bit about the context. Uh, you know, first of all, it is important to recognize that we live in a world which is increasingly interdependent. Uh, no longer we can see issues from a you know isolated perspective, and you as researchers know that very well. You know whatever you are doing has implications in the rest of the world and vice versa. It is a world that also it is increasingly also a globalized. We like it or not, this is the reality of the world today. It's a world which is increasingly global, you know, highly competitive. It is always driven by technology. It is changing constantly, and of course, more and more, we live in a world which is what I, you know, what is being known as the knowledge-based economy and society. And of course, you as researchers can, um, a, you know, produce a very elaborated econometric model to, rec to to see how globalized is the economy. For me, it's easier to explain that by describing a bottle of Mexican salsa, a Mexican um, a spicy salsa. And what it has that bottle, it, you know, you may say it's nothing extraordinary about it. But what I found is interesting is that it was made in the Netherlands with ingredients from Morocco, uh, distributed by a Chinese company, which I uh, was able to buy when I was living in Delhi, in India. So of course I said, you know, this is the best way to talk about the fact that not only the goods and services in the world are traveling and becoming increasingly integrated, but even the flavors, uh, even the others, if you want. Uh, the world is also increasingly interconnected. Our session of today is a very good example of that. Uh, we are connected from different parts of the world with absolutely no complications. But also, sadly, we live in a world which is increasingly turbulent. And also, positively, the world is increasingly fascinating. I wish I could be your age so I could experience what is going to happen in the world in the future. Uh, uh, I know that my time is relatively limited, but I'm very, uh, you know, very, very sure that, you know, the world is, uh, you know, is uh, uh, putting in front of us immense uh, areas of opportunities. And um, many years ago, when I was a teenager, I used to read in my hometown in Ojuelos, a magazine, a journal of a scientific journal, a very, very important journal, uh, which probably some of you know, which is uh, Reader's Digest. And uh, I say scientific because of course that was the only publication that we had at that time. And I'm sure that Robert Bevilla main uh, a uh, sort of resonate with that publication. But that publication, which was very famous at that time, used to have a section of quotable quotes. And there was a quotable quote that I remember reading at that time, which really, you know, from that time, I keep remembering all the time. And the quote said, when I think about the future, I become concerned about the present. And I think more than ever today in the pandemic, when we think about the future, we should be concerned about the present because there are many, many challenges ahead, many problems that the pandemic is um, sort of putting over the table, if you want, and of course, that are going to be important for us to think about. And of course, the geopolitical environment in the world is quite challenging. You know, it's a highly polarized economy and society in the world, and uh, in which is relatively easy to blame others for the problems we face, but also, of course, not to recognize that also we have a, a reason to be part of that. So in higher education specifically, there are a number of factors that uh, I think it is important to refer to as we are thinking about what is going to happen in the future. You know, challenges that higher education was facing before the pandemic are now still present. I will say are much more critical today, and it will be much more critical in the future. Um, challenges such as equitable access, limited relevance of higher education, and of course, other issues that are uh, also equally important. Let me talk just about two of them. 
in terms of equitable access, uh, the good news is that more people than, you know, more than ever, people are having access to higher education. And I should uh, say that uh, uh, some of this analysis is based, uh, by the way, in uh, something that Michelle helped me to do when uh, she collaborated with me at the World Bank. And uh, a, however, higher education enrollment uh, is not growing um, uh, equally in the world, especially in the low income countries. Still, higher education continues being an opportunity just for a few. While in other countries, uh, it is fortunately something available for the majority of the youth. But again, especially in low income countries, still that is a big problem. Um, and of course, in some countries, the growth has been spectacular. When I was working in India, I was just amazing to see that growth. Let me give you an example. While in the world, um, a, uh, there was a significant increase in, um, in, the, in the number of uh, higher education institutions and of course students in india the growth has been much more faster than in any part of the world just in the last 10 years there has been 6.3 new universities in india being founded per day including saturdays and sundays and of course that that, that can give you an idea of the significant transformation that a, a country like india is experiencing even that even that uh, growth, still India is expecting that their sort of the population that is gonna be ready to go to college by the year 2030, which is only nine years from now, is gonna be about 400 million. And of course you can see with a, a size of about 30 million, still you are talking about a very small percentage of the population, which is having the opportunity of access to higher education. And again, that happens all over the world, but the year 2020, there will be, no, there was about more university graduates in China, in China than uh, all the young people in Europe. And of course, the shifting distribution of the global stock of people is also transitioning in the world. So no longer, as I can see, the future of higher education will be defined for what happened in the developed countries, but for what happened in the low and middle income, especially the middle income economies in the world. So this is very important to take, to take in consideration because higher education has been transitioning in a very interesting way. There has been a sharp rise in access among the poor, but still, it is uh, unequal, the access. Still, there is a significant disparity in access to higher education, especially people from rural areas, women, uh, uh, people from disadvantaged uh, socioeconomic status, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Higher education continues being a privilege for a few. And I think we need to be very mindful of that because all of us participating at this session today have benefited from higher education but unfortunately, there are still many who are not. And they have exactly the same right that we have, but for whatever reason, might be the zip code, might be the socioeconomic status, maybe other factors, they didn't have the opportunity that all of us had. So all of us had a significant responsibility towards the one who didn't have the privilege that we have to have in higher education. And I think, and I'm very pleased to be speaking today to you as uh, young professionals, because again, you have achieved very important milestones in your life, but never forget that unfortunately, there are many who didn't have the same opportunity as you had. And also we need to keep in mind that the world is growing in the different ways. As you know, the, the share of adult population in the world is, keeps growing. And of course, the share of youth is going to be shrinking. And in some countries, that is very dramatic. You know, look at the case of Italy. And I understand that uh, Mariho lives in Italy. And, uh, you know, I remember reading on a newspaper in the, uh, 2016 this news item that uh, to me was really shocking. You know, one town in Italy, which was celebrating the fact that there was one baby was born in that place um, and that was a major news 
uh, because that was the first time in 20 years, 28 years that that happened. Of course, if we contrast that to what happens in other parts of the world, it's exactly an opposite situation. So of course, as you know very well, when you think about the projections of youth in the world, there is gonna be a dramatic transformation that is gonna be, of course, affecting in many ways, the landscape of the world and of course, the landscape of higher education. Growth is gonna be experienced in the world mostly because the contribution of the global middle class in Asia. And that's where, of course, most of the economic engine in the world is gonna be happening in the future. So there is gonna be, of course, a demographic shift, which is again, dramatic in the world that is gonna be affecting in many ways the world, of course, the economy, the society, and why not higher education as well. You know, think about the fact that by the year 2030, about 42% of the youth globally will be living in Africa. And if you think about the fact that in Africa, more than 70% of the youth is living with less than $2 per day, that can explain a lot about the inequalities in the world. And of course, about the potential big challenges that we will have in the world if we don't see these problems with a global perspective. Now, of course, education, all of you know that is the best formula for a better life. And also, you know that education has a significant economic incentive. People go to school because they want to have a better life, because they want to have higher income, because they want to have better conditions for themselves and for their families. Uh, studies from the World Bank show that about per year of studies that you have, you will have about 10% more of revenues in your life. But when you analyze the information by sectors of the, of the educational pipeline, you can see here that higher education is the subsector of education in which there are the highest economic returns. In some countries, in some regions of the world, such as the case of Africa, is the largest one, about 21%. And in other parts of the world, for instance, where I live in the Middle East, is uh, the lowest one, but still it is again where it pays back. And also we know that higher education is much more than just economic returns. We know for instance, that people who experience higher education tend to value, for instance, more democracy than people who don't have the opportunity of higher education. We know that also as well that people with uh, um, access to higher education tend to have a healthier life. Consequently, th they tend to live longer. Also, people with higher education tend to be more tolerant about uh, different perspectives of the world, more multicultural. And of course, higher education is very important because that prevents uh, to come out with many of the stereotypes that exist in the world about each other, for which, again, the experience of being in a university also helps to have this precise, this understanding of what happens in the world. Of course, a key challenge is how to balance um, equality of opportunities with high academic standards, as well as with relevance. So, um, and the other important issue to mention is that even though higher education has the highest economic returns, sadly, the returns are declining. And that happens for two reasons the declines in the returns, uh, economic returns of education happens either because there is a, uh, a, an imbalance in terms of the graduates and the capacity of the labor market to absorb them, and or because the graduates of higher education are not having the right skills that are going to be needed in such a labor market. And of course, that creates the problem of many individuals who have higher education, but who cannot experience the opportunities that higher education is supposed to provide to them. So this is the case of Angelo, who I met him in India. He had a master's degree in economics, but he was working as a touristic guide uh, because he didn't have any other opportunity in life. And I'm sure that you know too many people in the world, too many colleagues probably, who also had higher education, but didn't have the opportunity to work on the profession that they work for. And of course, the last factor that I like to mention before we go into the COVID is about technology. 
because as you know, technology is transforming and has transformed dramatically the world. Uh, Ruben probably might be the only one and myself who uh, know what, uh, who knows what is a slide rule. And I mentioned this because slide rules, when we were students, were the equivalent to the calculators. We didn't have any calculator. We didn't have any computer back in those years. So we had to make our calculations using the slide rule. And at that time, interestingly, as you can see this uh, advertising from IBM was talking about the fact that, you know, they are at that time were able to create or to uh, manufacture the, uh, a, a big computer that was able to do the work of 150 slide rules. And of course, recently I was reading about the fact that Google was, um, you know, uh, putting together a computer that it will be a little bit faster, I might say, than what it was the slide rule when we were students in the absence of computers. So, of course, in the, the reality of the world, which is increasingly automated, there is no doubt that the pace of change that science is going to have is going to be much faster than what it had in the last 400 years. And that is precisely the world where you are going to be working. But at the same time, don't forget, please, as John uh, graduates, and I, again, I'm sure that um, all of you resonated with that because you are part of this very interesting group, which is really concerned about social change. At the same time, as technologies, you know, fast, in a very fascinating way, moving ahead, don't forget the fact that there are many who are not having the opportunity of that technology. Uh, there are many which are not experiencing the opportunities that all of us have. And even in education, there are many in the world which are not having even a chance to experience the basic things that you can think about. The disparities of the world and the disparities in education are present and we need to recognize them. And that's why it is important, again, to make the case about the importance of connecting more effectively the realities of the world. Those realities are there. And of course, all depends on where you are in order to figure out a way the difference in the world. And those distant realities are realities that sometimes, believe it or not, are not so distant. As you can see in these two pictures, you may tell me where do you want to live in one side or in the other. And these distant realities are not really so distant because there is only a wall separating them. As you can see again in this picture in Sao Paulo and Brazil. So of course, when we think about the way that knowledge is gonna be really making a big difference, we need to think about ways in which we can make that more accessible to others. And of course, technology is changing our lives in many ways, sometimes not always as we can expect. Um, there are, of course, uh, things that we never imagined. Um, many years ago, for us to think about what would be Wi-Fi would be just some, something completely unthinkable. And of course, higher education institutions need to change and of course will have to change because the realities of the world are forcing them to see these new uh, contextual things that of course the youth is going to be very different in the future as it was in the past and of course all of you are going to be part of this reality now the pandemic arrives did we listen about all the challenges or problems we are facing probably not the realities of the world in the past are the realities that probably we shouldn't try to just prolong in the future. In many ways, the vision that we have about the world and about education has been relatively naive. And of course, there have been many who have been talking about the fact that higher education must change, must adapt to the new realities. Back in 1997, Peter Drucker said, universities will disappear. Probably he was wrong in India, as I mentioned to you, there are seven new universities per day. So that might not be a reality. Or probably he was making the point 
that we really need to reconsider what is going on in higher education. Of course, the pandemic arrives. It is something that it was completely unexpected. Nobody could predict that it was gonna happen with that significant magnitude. Globalization really became in retreat for the first time since the World War II. Transportation in the world was suddenly stopped. And of course, education was affected as well. In just a period of three months, literally education in the world became completely paralyzed. Universities have to address the urgent while delaying the important. An interesting study conducted in the US with presidents of universities showed that presidents of universities started to become concerned about things that they never imagined before, even the possibility that eventually universities will be closing in the future. And just to give you an idea of the magnitude of the crisis in higher education, globally more than 200 million higher education students have been unable to go back to school. Approximately 70% of international students had to return to their home and 30% staying in the countries, really they were experiencing significant problems, in many cases economic, in even cases even discrimination and even uh, retaliation against them. And only 60% of the students in the world have been able to continue in some way their higher education studies. Uh, through remote means, which that, that sig the significance of that is about 40% of the students globally are not having the opportunity to continue their education. And that is a significant challenge, of course. The digital divide, of course, affects a lot access to higher education because there are parts of the world in which internet penetration is very, very small in comparison to other parts of the world. And this is a reality that, again, we like it or not, we need to recognize. The digital divide is a reality in the world, and it affects education, and it affects, of course, higher education. This is a picture, for instance, in Bolivia, where students have to go to the mountain in order to have some kind of connectivity uh, a, uh, to the internet. Even in the US, you may think that they have 100% access to higher, to, to uh, Take good connectivity, and that is not the case. There are many students, even in the US, that are experiencing significant difficulties in having uh, access to education through remote lines. So the crisis basically is teaching us very significant lessons. First of all, that we were not prepared in higher education and research to deal with this uh, pandemic. Secondly, that the operational environment of our institutions is very fragile, that we also learned that online education is relatively easy to implement, but is not the solution to the long-term problems. We, need, we learn also that leadership is differently needed in times of crisis. Also, we learned that many of the challenges that we were facing in education, such as inequality of access, inequality of use of technology, has been exacerbated because of the crisis. And of course, also we are learning that many of the traditional assumptions that we had about higher education really need to be challenged because those are assumptions that probably might be wrong. The reality is that the world is experiencing a dramatic economic crisis. China is the only country in the world that in the year 2020 experienced a positive economic growth the rest of the world experienced a negative world of a significant magnitude. And of course, many factors are being affected. For instance, international education. Think about this. If you look at the uh, popularity of the terms in Google, you find that ter the term online courses really became so popular from February to April of last year. And of course, the, the term study abroad literally disappeared from the map. In some countries, that affected a lot. Look at the case of Australia, for instance. In Australia, you find institutions in which about 40% of the enrollment was composed by international students. As the students were unable to continue their education, now many universities in Australia are facing a very significant economic challenge 
because they were relying on the international students. The research work also was relying on international students who suddenly cannot continue their education. And of course, that happens all over the world. In the case of the United States, also it has been experienced a significant decline in international students, which is gonna be affecting the capacity of institutions to do research and to conduct their graduate education. So in the short term, what are the implications of the crisis? That there is and there will be you know, fewer economic resources in the economies, in the countries, and of course, in the families, and of course, in the higher education institutions. The world is experiencing higher dropout rates of students and many more students which are deciding not to continue their education for the time being. There are fewer international students in the world. In some countries, there is zero student mobility. And of course, there is a significant impact on the capacity to conduct research. Because, you know, the, the absence of the opportunities for research and also the resources to do that are not as they used to be. Some of you are dedicated to teach. And of course, you know well that we were not really prepared to teach with this new environment. Um, many teachers had to learn to uh, teach uh, using online tools in a relatively quick way. And of course, uh, doing many things at the same time. So suddenly we requested from teachers to learn to become entertainers because uh, they needed also to use digital pedagogies, et cetera, et cetera. Many parents, of course, also had experienced the same challenge because parents had to contribute to the education of their kids in a much more effective way uh, because um, no longer students are going to the schools. So some of the challenges ahead in education, in higher education is that still we are struggling to figure out how to minimize the learning deficit of the students, how to address the problem of the digital technology um, and the gap, how to keep students interested in the teaching learning process, how to evaluate the education of the students because things have changed. And of course, how to mitigate the significant economic um, uh, implications that will have the crisis in higher education institutions. So this is the reality of higher education today. It's not a rosy picture because the complications and the challenges are very significant ahead. In terms of uh, the teaching learning, I'm sure that all of you have experienced this if you are teaching or if you are learning, uh, that not all the time you are highly interested on the lectures of the teachers. In fact, a study conducted in Mexico at the University of Querétaro as a good example show that only two out of 10 students were expressing positive perceptions about the online learning environment. And also at the graduate level, uh, many students in the world are experiencing the realities of the pandemic. Uh, many students are experiencing economic difficulties. And also, of course, many students are experiencing mental challenges precisely because the fact that they don't have the opportunity to socialize and to interact with peers at the, as they used to do. Even teachers are experiencing the problem. A study conducted by Yale University shows that a number of teachers are also experiencing depression and anxiety. And of course, transitioning the teaching to Zoom was not as easy as you can imagine. In fact, as Stephen Cosley says in a sarcastic way, lectures are a wonderful way to teach, but a terrible way to learn. So there are things that we have learned very quickly. For instance, that you know, the exposure in class should be shorter than you need to apply learning uh, modalities uh, which are based on uh, digital pedagogies, but also even you have to go back to the back to the basic by teaching uh, the Socratic methods in order to make the learning of the students much more meaningful. And of course, something that we have learned is that teachers need to learn, need to continue being learning for the rest of their life. 
Don't forget that we are living today in the largest social experiment in our life. And of course, that becomes a significant opportunity to reimagine, to reinvent the way we teach, the way we learn. Think about that. Look at this comparison between the traditional and the new paradigm of teaching and learning. And of course, we need to figure out ways in order to make that transition in order for teachers to be facilitators of learning and of course in order for students to be the actors if you want of their own learning so in summary we live in a new normal did you imagine about a year ago that a stadium in south korea will have to be filled with pictures of the fans or that um, restaurants will have this type of barriers, or that schools will have to have this type of barriers, or even that in the church, they will have to put the pictures of uh, the uh, parishioners, or that places such as Mecca, which is always full of people, suddenly will become completely empty, or that in this restaurant in Thailand, um, they will have to make these separations or even in the manufacturing lines or even here in Qatar, they will have these mannequins in the restaurants in order to uh, foster the social distancing. Did you imagine about a year ago that we won't be able to hug your uh, elderly uh, family or that even social distancing will have to change? You know, those are some of the changes that the world is experiencing that of course, we never imagined about a year ago. And universities as well have, express, have experienced a significant transformation. Those were the universities of the past, full of students, full of energy, with big commencement ceremonies, etc. Suddenly those institutions became completely empty, conducting virtual commencement ceremonies, or even sometimes using robots for those ceremonies. So about a year ago, a lot of people, including myself, never used Zoom, for instance. Now it is part of the new reality. And of course, there is anxiety and uncertainty because nobody knows what is going to happen. It's a new social life on campus because, of course, we like it or not, all these realities of today are impacting all of us. The good news is that human teachers are more needed than ever. So this is a good news. But of course, in this new reality, we need to learn to see with different lenses. So the question for you is, will the COVID pandemic will change or not the modus of operandi of higher education and research in the future? I guess it already has changed. There is a new normal as well in education. We no longer can think about just opening or closing the university. There are different ways in which institutions are having to figure out how to continue their operations. Online education is, of course, now a new reality. Uh, blended learning modes are going to be part of the new reality. Economic impact of higher education is going to be significant. In fact, there are many universities in the world that unfortunately will have to close if they continue with no operations because of course the financial sustainability of those institutions no longer will allow them to continue. And if we think about the future, again, some of the things that we have learned is that this is also a time to question some of the dogmas, some of the assumptions that we had about higher education. So who told us that internationalization is only about attracting fee paying foreign students? Are rankings as important as we think? Do students learn for what we teach or independently of what we teach? What is education at the end of the day? Is about skills for jobs or is about skills for life and also for responsible citizens? And I think those are the kind of assumptions that I hope that you as researchers that you as scholars and practitioners really can help us to find the solutions to those problems. I think it is a time of what I see as a renewed landscape for higher education and research. 
Many times in the traditional scenario, we don't know if, if students are learning. We don't even know if students are only learning to remember rather than to create, evaluate, or analyze. We did a study uh, when I was working at the World Bank uh, in different countries, just about measuring what happens with the students when they get into college and when they get out of college. And what you can find here is very interesting. You find that even in some cases, students not only don't learn, but probably de learn as they continue their education. So we need to do much more research on that. We need to know what happens in the teaching learning experience that is preventing for many students to graduate, but not to have the right set of skills that are gonna be needed for life. It is time to question if the way we are dissecting the knowledge in our institutions is really reflecting what is the reality of the world outside of our higher education institutions. We need to rethink the way that we are preparing students for the skills that are gonna be needed for the future, for which probably we don't have the right mix of knowledge in our traditional classroom and in, in our traditional um, a academic workload. So in other words, in my opinion, this is a unique momentum. It looks like the planets have been aligned because it is a time to challenge the assumptions and it's a time to reinvent, to rethink about education for the future. I will invite you to take a look to a report that um, we prepared with the economist here at Qatar Foundation, which precisely it is a report that uh, talks about the new schools of thought. It talks about how we can uh, put in place innovative models for delivery of higher education for the future. Because there are many interesting cases happening in the world about institutions of higher education which are trying to challenge those assumptions and are trying precisely to come up with new models for education. So the big question that I have always is if higher education today in the pandemic is just reacting, is emulating, or is proactively engaged in fostering change for themselves, but more important for the rest of society. Before COVID and after COVID, the role of higher education really is changing. We need to think about a, a, um, a higher education, which also, you know, pays more attention to humanity, uh, places more attention to empathy, places more attention to compassion, and of course, places more attention to humanizing the, the, the role of education for a better, for a better world. So there are areas of opportunity for disruptive education how to articulate more effectively our educational institutions, how to recognize learning outside of the classroom, how to um, be more flexible in our higher education institutions, how to bring the community to our universities, and how to have our universities going into the community, how to set up mechanisms for virtual mobility or for internationalization at home. Those are some of the issues that we are discussing today in the higher education arena. And when we are talking to teachers and we are talking to administrators about the importance of taking advantage of this unique momentum and not waiting to think about going back to business as usual as the pandemic ends. Because if we do that, we are gonna miss a great opportunity. Sadly, in higher education, we have the tendency to exercise the art of ambiguity, which is to continue doing the same, but waiting different results. And of course, the big paradox is that higher education institutions are institutions which are aimed at fostering social change, but at the same time, they have the tendency to inhibit their innovation capacity. Uh, in a kind of in a joke, if you want, Sometimes people question if higher education institutions really have changed in many years. Um, a lot of people question if probably what we are doing in a university seems to be very similar to what used to be some time ago. Um, I remember seeing this picture uh, painting of an Italian university, 1350. And I wonder 
if the universities before COVID still were relatively the same. Probably it changed the clothing and the technology, but we continue assuming uh, the traditional teaching learning model. And of course, that there is no magic formula. What it might work in one case might not work in other cases, but I think it is important to recognize that for complex problems, of course, there are complex solutions. Simple solutions might not be the case. So let me just finish by quoting um, a, a two people that I like to quote in this type of opportunities. One is Charles Darwin, who said um, that it is not the strongest of the species that survive, not even the most intelligent, but the one that is most responsive to change. And then there is another quote that I really uh, 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 like to use all the time from Paul Valeri, who said in about 100 years ago, 90 years ago, that the trouble with our times is that the future is not what it used to be. Um, I am a firm believer that the future cannot be extrapolated, although Francisco and I had lengthy discussions about it, that also that the future cannot be guessed with a crystal ball. I, I truly believe that the future is something that you build today. So my invitation to all of you as young professionals, young researchers, as uh, professionals and researchers which are truly committed to social change is to start building that better future that um, uh, the humanity is gonna be needed. And for all of you to think about the ways in which you really can be instrumental for that. The future is in your hands. The world that we, the old people are living to you is really messy, is really complicated, but also it's a world which I, I'm sure that it will be fascinating. And again, a world in which you are gonna be making a big difference. So thank you very much for your patience with me. And I hope that um, these reflections, as I mentioned before, at least can um, leave you a little bit confused because if that is the case, I guess that I was able to fulfill my, my goal. Thank you. Um, well, th thank you so much for, for the talk. Um, really intriguing perspectives, lots of food for thought and, and very apt for, like you mentioned, the, I, I think it's actually quite interesting to think about because md for sg as an initiative is always before even the pandemic had this uh, forward thinking interdisciplinary work that has been remote. And uh, I mean, we've been working in this, it, it's almost as if uh, post pandemic, we've, we've um, the practices we've been doing have, have helped um, going forward. Um, I, I, I leave the floor open to, to discussion um, and perhaps maybe to start, I just have a, a quick question um, on uh, internationalization of education. So knowing that uh, you have an extensive background in international higher education. And um, I, I was just curious what you thought were some of the best practices of, of making this fundamentally non-virtual experience virtual. I mean, thinking about the, if the pandemic you mentioned has forced multiple students to not be able to go abroad. Um, and, and, and you've worked uh, in, in this for so long. And now I, I'm, I'm sure that there's work that's being done in terms of somehow replacing some of the benefits of the system in a virtual setting or of creating some of the incentives for students to partake in these benefits in spite of not going there in the first place. And I was wondering if, if maybe you knew of some um, schemes that have been have been working in this space. Yeah, no, there is, uh, a, you know, so something that uh, to, to keep in mind is that, <clears throat> you know, all of us know, as I mentioned before, that unfortunately higher education is very elitist. You know, we are just a few in the world who have the benefit of higher education. But international higher education is even more elitist. Just to give you an idea, only about 1% of uh, global higher education students have the opportunity to experience uh, mobility, to, to, to go abroad either for a semester or a summer or even for the entire academic career. Only 1%. So all the efforts that traditionally we have done in, in international higher education, sadly, had been aimed at only benefiting about 1% of the students. And even uh, countries may make a significant effort in trying to increase the number of students who go abroad. But even that, let's imagine that it, it doubles or, or goes triple, it, it will go from 1% to 2% or even to 3%. 
So the big challenge that we faced uh, uh, historically is how to benefit, uh, how to uh, allow the benefit of international education to a greater number of students. And um, the pandemic, of course, as you can imagine, made that problem even worse because even that 1% was or is being unable to experience that. So uh, there is a lot of uh, discussion and a lot of action being taken in establishing initiatives uh, under a term that we refer to as comprehensive internationalization or internationalization at home. And, and um, a, precisely, uh, which is a, an entire strategy that higher education institutions in some countries is uh, a putting in place in order to add the international dimension, not only for the 1%, but for all the students. And the best tool that we have in our higher education institutions is the curriculum. When the curriculum, when we are able to internationalize the curriculum, when we are able to provide um, the international dimension into the regular classroom, then we are providing an opportunity for more students to benefit from that. In addition to that, there are a number of techniques and, and uh, activities that have been in place. One of them is the topic of virtual mobility. And, and again, uh, the, the, the term is, is a little bit misleading, but in a way, what it means is that, um, you know, how to enable the opportunity for students from different parts of the world through a, a, a mirror teaching, you know, let's say a, a professor, a faculty member at Oxford University connected with a faculty member in an institution in India, as well as an institution in South America. And then they force the students to work together in this type of environment. And also there is the collective learning in a particular common subject, but again, connecting uh, using the, the, the technology. So uh, now initiatives such as uh, a uh, virtual mobility are proliferating in the world. There are very interesting cases. There are terrible, terrible cases as well. So there are uh, situations in which is not working as you can imagine, uh, sometimes because universities uh, resist that, uh, that uh, a, uh, sort of recognition of the learning uh, that is happening beyond the conventional, but uh, virtual mobility is another, a, an excellent way to facilitate that internationalization. But as I mentioned before, you know, we always should think about the 99%. Uh, if, we con if we keep concentrating on just the traditional uh, student mobility, we are gonna be missing the point about the need to provide the global dimension not to the 1%, but to all students in our higher education institutions. Thank you. Um, so I guess uh, I'm just looking to see, I don't think that, that everyone, please feel free to post questions on the chat or chime in at any moment. Um, I see here um, one of the attendees who refers to uh, uh, how COVID uh, feels like a wartime attack on the future workforce. It is, it is true. It's, it's not an easy time, I should confess. You know, I, I wish I could be much more optimistic, but I think it is a challenging time ahead. But at the same time, I think that challenging time is what it also uh, helps to really disrupt and also to reinvent and to reimagine education. Uh, I think you've raised your hand, please uh, yeah. go ahead. Thank you for the presentation, Francisco. Uh, indeed, uh, the, this time of the pandemic is really bad for, I think, for all educations. Uh, uh, and I feel like uh, primary schools and secondary schools are the most affected, uh, moreover, the, the small kids. Uh, but in higher education, I believe that we still have the opportunity to use all these technologies. Um, I work as a professor in the university here in, in Peru, and one of the main challenges that we were dealing with is um, connectivity. Mm -hmm. So um, there are many of our students that do not have computers even, and they were stuck in their own 
towns and cities uh, where connectivity is very low. Uh, and of course, we were uh, encouraging uh, our professors to uh, come up with good ideas for a students' evaluations and to use, I don't know, uh, some kind of tools, um, you know, multiple choice uh, exams and all of these exams. But we have some um, professors that were like not so happy with it. Because of um, because there is a here in South America and at least in Peru, there is a lot of um, concern about cheating. So yeah. I would like to ask about uh, I don't know if you had time to explore some uh, good practices uh, to prevent. I I I don't believe actually prevention can happen in an online ba basis, but some kind of strategies that can help us to reduce cheating. Well, you know, it's uh, this is um, this is a, a a problem that has been experienced uh, globally, unfortunately. Uh, a, um, a, you know, this um, the, the 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 delivery uh, the remote delivery is uh, is causing that uh, that uh, challenge you know what what countries are doing well you find the country number of countries in which basically they have decided to uh, to change the grading system and um, in in order to avoid the traditional grading by saying just you know pay some fail basically that's that's a way that uh, they have been able to cope with this in a very short term. Um, there are some technologies that I'm sure that all of you know that are now uh, being experienced to um, or being used to uh, reduce the potential risk of plagiarism and uh, and many of the implications related to that side of the cheating side. Um, there are, of course, um, and that requires for teachers, I'm sure that you are experiencing this, uh, they need to be much more um, sort of uh, personalized in the evaluation of the one by one students, which is, of course, a significant challenge as well. And, um, and of course, there are no easy solutions uh, to that. Um, uh, many of the things that, of course, need to be done uh, have to do also with the um, sort of raising of the consciousness of the students about the need for them to be honest, which, of course, it is a big challenge. Um, not only I might say the problem of the cheating of the students, but the problem of the interaction of, with the students, I'm sure that most likely all of you are experiencing if you are teaching, uh, what happens is that students connect, but you really don't know if the students really are participating in the class, uh, you know, and uh, because the privacy issues and all those type of elements, that is something that is affecting. This is one of the areas, by the way, where I believe that there is a significant opportunity for the development of new tools uh, for which again, this might become an interesting research uh, and uh, innovation opportunity that, uh, that some of you can be involved in because uh, there is too much that will need to be done in order to facilitate that. What I believe is that as universities will go back to some kind of normalcy if they will continue going back to some kind of blended learning, um, as it is happening now in some countries, this will continue being a significant challenge ahead in the part that has to do with the remote part of the teaching learning. Some universities, what they are doing, as you know, is that they are keeping students away from the institution with the exception of the testing of the knowledge. And for the testing of the knowledge, they are having to create these bubbles of learning in which they bring a, a group of students and that uh, they are doing the evaluation of the knowledge uh, uh, based on the, uh, you know, uh, keeping the social distancing. But of course, the final thing that I like to mention is that um, the need to uh, reimagine the assessment tools that we use is something that is fundamental. Do we really want to continue um, assuming that the knowledge of the students, the only way that can be measured is by having a traditional test and having a traditional grade? Probably not. Probably it is a time to think about another ways to assess the overall knowledge of the students. Again, it's a big question mark, too much to, to learn about it. This is work in progress. 
Thank you. I think that there are a couple of questions in the chat. Um, uh, so Juan Felipe, I'll just go in order, mentions that if, if you could do one or two things to prevent higher education institutions in emerging economies to keep doing the same as in the pre-pandemic world, what would they be? Um, and do you think they will adapt fast enough to avoid the steepening gap in advanced economies in terms of quality and relevance of higher education? Well, you know, rather than if I will do that, I will say what reality is doing. You know, it's I, I recently um, we put together during the last uh, semester a massive uh, a, a, a learning environment with administrators from higher education in Latin America. And we have more than 500 uh, Latin American higher education leaders and administrators participating in this. And basically what we are doing in this, uh, in this exercise, which was fascinating and very interesting, was precisely to based on the assumption about the, you know, let's rebuild the building, you know, let's uh, destroy the building and let's rebuild the building with, uh, with, the, with the new tools. And uh, many of the things that higher education institutions are doing, first of all, is the regulatory environment needs to change. There is no question about it because many of the changes that universities want to do, if the regulatory environment doesn't change, it's gonna be very difficult for that to be implemented. Secondly, you find institutions which are challenging this idea that uh, you can, um, that you required, let's say for a undergraduate program, that you required the traditional classroom setting, the traditional teacher, and also the traditional um, number of years in order to obtain your education. So many institutions are finally accepting the opportunity to recognize the learning outside of the classroom, the, uh, the learning on their own. You go to other countries in which, for instance, they already have accepted that you as a student can uh, uh, decide what to learn um, um, online for about 20, and in some countries it's about 30% of your entire education. And the institutions are, of course, in need to recognize that learning as part of the traditional education. So there are many of those things that are happening in higher education institutions. That's where I see the alignment of the planets that I was making the point about it. Even though the scenario is complicated, the fact that a number of institutions are really accepting that as a challenge to change, it is something that gives me a lot of hope. For instance, here, in Qatar Foundation, with all the institutions that we have in our ecosystem, some of the things that we are doing, we never imagined that we were we were going to be able to do them uh, be, before the crisis. Right now, the, this idea of personalized learning, flexible learning, uh, more education for life rather than just for the specifics of the profession, this is something that, again, we never imagined that we were going to be able to do before the crisis. Now, because the crisis, everybody's willing to collaborate on that. And now we are coming back with a new academic model for our educational institutions here at Qatar Foundation, which I think it is going to be a significant difference because this is what students were requiring. But we in our institutions were so hesitant to, uh, to, to recognize that need for change. So that's where I see the opportunities. Where, that's where I have some sense of optimism beyond the pessimism of the realities of today's world. And, and I guess we have time for one or maybe another question after that, but going to Elizabeth Evans has asked in the chat um, for whether in addition to connectivity issues, uh, what the impact is of having access to proper tools. And I, I, she gives a really relevant example about Chromebooks um, in, in New Hampshire in the US and how some of these Chromebooks have been paid for separately in the state um, due to these lower costs, but this gives an issue for connectivity to Zoom, for example. And immediately that's a concrete example of disparity of, uh, of, um, of access to tools. In fact, well, it's something that I can mention that we've seen here at Oxford in the interview season, which we just had. Some students had proper access to tools to be doing the mathematics interviews and some did not. And uh, this is a very valid immediate impact that I, I don't know what you think about overcoming this over time or ways of dealing with this. Well, I, I think um, 
uh, this is precisely uh, what I was making the point about the challenge of the inequality of uh, opportunities and the impact of the digital divide in uh, inequality in higher education. Um, um, there is a chart, I didn't share that with you, but there is a chart that uh, I use in some presentations that shows very clearly the percentage of students uh, who have um, a, a computer or a, a, a device at home in, in, uh, in countries contingent to the school of, um, at the high school level, no, it's not a higher education, but at the high school level, contingent to the, um, a, um, the, um, to the school, uh, the type of school in which they are enrolled. And that shows very clearly the significant disparity that exists in some countries. And when you correlate that to the academic performance of the students, as you can imagine, you find a significant relationship there. So a, uh, that is, of course, one of the big challenges that uh, it, is, uh, it is true and that exists. Uh, uh, in some countries, I have seen some interesting efforts that have been trying to address this problem. I remember the case of uh, a university, the University of uh, Campinas in Brazil, who, um, a, um, while struggling with this problem, they precisely um, a, um, addressed the problem, the University of Guadalajara in Mexico as well, in making accessible technology to all students. That has significant, uh, sig that has um, a, 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 a resulted in a significant uh, economic burden for the institution, but the institution really made the effort in trying to avoid the problem of disparity uh, by making available um, a technological device to all students who were in need for that. Uh, that requires, of course, brave decisions by institutional decision makers. Not all uh, institutions and not in all the countries, institutions are interested in doing that. And of course, that is a problem that needs to be addressed uh, because in the post-pandemic world, um, that is going to be creating a big difference in terms of uh, access of opportunities. Well, thank you. I mean, I, I don't know if there are any more questions, but I also want to be mindful that um, that we're running a little bit uh, tight on time now, and I know that um, uh, you, you'll have to head out um, that shortly after we finish. Um, so, so I guess maybe with this, I'll just probably time to wrap up the session, but I wanted to say once again, thank you so much for, for taking the time. It's been incredibly interesting to hear your perspectives on the future of higher education. It's a very tumultuous time that we're in and we're all living it personally. This Zoom call is in part a testament of all that we're living. And like you said, I think a great takeaway is to think about how to see the silver lining in all of this and see how we can disrupt the future of higher education for better good. Um, it's, it's a difficult but unique time. And, and I think that you've posited lots of important problems that we can hopefully work on within MD for SG. So, well, so thank, thank you, you very much, Francisco. And thanks to all of you. The world needs disruptors. And I'm um, very confident that all of you, all of you are disruptors and that consequently you are gonna be able to change the world. Great. Well, Thanks everybody so much for taking the time to join us as well. Um, I don't know if, if we have any announcements for future meetings or if... Uh, uh... Oh, maybe just uh, thank you so much again that the meeting will be shared, uh, the link will be shared so we'll be able to see it later on as well. Uh, and stay tuned for our February colloquium as well. But thank you so much, uh, Francisco, for joining us and for a wonderful talk and Francisco for leading the discussion too. It has been a real honor for me. Thank you. All right. Well, bye, everyone.